After it is designed, but before it can be occupied, a building must be constructed. This is the story of the construction of Paul Milstein Hall at Cornell University. The foundation walls of Milstein Hall are in place, surrounding below-grade spaces that include a small garden, an exhibition space, an auditorium, a space for studio critiques, and a rather unique set of bathrooms. We'll see more about this later. To complete the substructure, several additional construction steps are necessary, as can be seen in this schematic animation. The perimeter foundation walls need to be waterproofed, insulated, and backfilled. The basement slab on grade must be cast, and the first floor slabs must be formed and cast. Let's look at each of these operations. Waterproofing for Milstein Hall is adhered to the outside surfaces of the foundation walls. First, a primer is applied to the concrete surfaces. Then, a self-adhesive composite membrane consisting of rubberized asphalt and cross-laminated high-density polyethylene film is pressed into place. Rigid insulation is then placed against this membrane. Finally, the excavated areas are filled in. Soil can be delivered to the site in special trucks that shoot it into the excavated spaces, or else lowered into place by crane. In either case, the soil must be carefully compacted so that it doesn't settle too much later. It's all got to be compacted and, and whatnot for the specification. Some of this backfilling must wait until the first floor concrete slabs are in place so that they can brace the foundation walls against the lateral stress of the soil. Before the basement slabs are cast, under slab mechanical ducts must be assembled and put into place. Then the soil is compacted, much like the backfilled soil on the outside of the foundation walls. To keep moisture from diffusing upwards into the occupied space, a heavy-duty vapor retarder is placed over the soil. Gravel is placed above the vapor retarder. Before the slab is cast, conduit may be placed in the gravel. In some cases, this conduit brings power to floor-mounted outlets, as in this exhibition space. The outlet boxes are held in place by gobs of concrete, so they will not move when the actual slab is cast. Plumbing pipes are also put in place below the slab. These waste vent and water pipes are for the unusual intertwined men's room and women's room that we looked at earlier. Reinforcement, welded wire mesh similar to the reinforcement in sidewalks, is then placed over the gravel and the concrete slab is cast in place. We'll see some better images of the casting process when we get to the first floor slab. The concrete is finished with a power trowel Plastic sheets are then placed over the fresh concrete so that the water stays in the concrete as it cures. If water were allowed to evaporate from the top of an uncovered slab, there might not be enough water available at the top of the slab for proper curing. After the concrete has cured sufficiently, control joints are actually cut into the slab with a diamond-tipped saw. These joints are only about an inch or so deep and direct any potential cracks, cracks that might occur due to shrinkage or uneven settlement, into these lines of weakness rather than letting the concrete itself decide where it wants to crack. In theory, the first floor slabs could be cast at any time after the foundation walls are in place. In practice, it's much easier to build the required formwork for these slabs on top of the basement slab rather than on the uneven and softer soil. For this reason, the first floor slabs in Milstein Hall are always cast above basement slabs. Shoring is built up from the basement slab, much like any other steel structure consisting of posts, beams, and closely spaced joists. In this case, though, the structural elements are temporary and reusable. Because the bottom surface of the first floor slabs will be visible as the basement ceiling, care is taken in placing the wooden boards over the metal formwork joists. A special type of overlaid plywood with a surface layer of medium density fiber is used. A form release agent is brushed onto this wooden surface. Then, reinforcing bars are placed over the wooden forms. Unlike the basement slab on ground, which is completely supported by the soil below, the first floor slab requires more serious reinforcement, 
since it is actually spanning from wall to wall. To understand how this reinforcement works and why some is placed towards the bottom of the slab while other bars are placed towards the top, let's look at a schematic representation of the slab, resting on two walls and extending outward beyond the inner wall. When a load is placed on the slab, due to its own weight plus the weight of people or furnishings, the slab deflects. Because of the continuity of the concrete, this deflection or curvature is a bit complex. The concrete curves downward at mid-span, but its curvature reverses over the walls. This curvature causes the slab to stretch and compress, with stretching occurring sometimes at the bottom and sometimes at the top, and compression always occurring on the opposite side of the stretching. The key point in all this is that steel reinforcement is really only needed where the slab stretches, since concrete cannot resist the stretching or tension very well. Bottom bars are placed where stretching is anticipated at the bottom of the slab, while top bars are placed where stretching is anticipated at the top. In practice, it is common to run the bottom bars continuously, especially since the actual pattern of loads is constantly changing, causing the points of inflection points where the curvature reverses to shift back and forth along the length of the slab. Let's go up to the first floor to see this reinforcement close up. We'll see two other elements here. In addition to the top and bottom bars described earlier, steel bars are also placed perpendicular to the main steel to control cracking due to shrinkage or temperature movement. Second, the bars rest on chairs, plastic devices that remain in the formwork and ensure that the bars are positioned three quarters of an inch inside the outer faces of the concrete. In the case of the bottom bars, the concrete face is coincident with the formwork itself, so that the chairs are made exactly three quarters of an inch high. In the case of the top bars, chairs are used to position the bars at such a height that they will have at least three quarters of an inch of concrete cover above them after the slab is cast. This cover provides protection against both corrosion and fire. Oh, and these cutouts, any idea what they're doing? They're uh, mechanical cutouts, so for ductwork to come through. And al along that diagonal, is that also mechanical cutouts? Once all the reinforcement is in place, concrete is pumped into the form. The concrete is then finished using various specialized tools, including a power screed. The main idea is that when they finally finish, they have to be at a point where they can actually get down without walking over the fresh concrete. Finally, the concrete is covered with a plastic sheet until it is sufficiently cured. This process is repeated as first floor slabs are later cast to the west of the main structure of Milstein Hall, above the basement exhibition gallery area, and even further west where structured parking was originally planned. The same steps are followed as before. Temporary shoring and form boards are put into place, then reinforcement, conduit for electricity, pipes for sprinklers, followed by the casting of the concrete, finishing, and curing. Eventually, in the middle of the summer, they'll start forming this dome, but they've got the rebar sticking out, as you can see.